Spurs had a brilliant end to the year yesterday with a 3-1 win against Bournemouth and even better with Arsenal losing at Craven Cottage to Fulham two goals to one. But I hope you all had a brilliant New Year's Eve. I hope you're all recovering well from last night's celebrations. But welcome to 2024. This is your New Year's Day live stream for you guys. I'm here with Barnaby Slater from the Spurred On podcast to talk about what happened yesterday and we'll discuss the performance and uh, what we thought about everything going on yesterday. Say we'll do Twitter reacts as well, reacting to how social media uh, reacted to Spurs' victory. But um, without further ado, um, let's talk about just in general. Yesterday, it was a look. It was a brilliant win for Spurs uh, against a very informed team in Bournemouth. They were, you know, coming into this game eight. Uh, Premier League wins out of their last 10 games. Uh, as Postacoglu said after the game, arguably the most informed team in the league uh, yesterday. And obviously coming away with a victory um, by any means was, was is, is brilliant. But in terms of performance level in general, how do you feel like we played yesterday? Well, before I get into that, Sim, is sure. it worth me mentioning first what we said in our match preview <laughs> when I said, <laughs> of course and, you're I, gonna bring and it I up. believe I said I had a good feeling about it because when Everton came, they were on a good run and we stopped that. And then when I just felt like Bournemouth would be on, about, on, a, on a good run and maybe we'd put a stop to that. And maybe I even said I thought it would be 3-1. Now, Sim, I Spot think on. I remember you saying <laughs> that you thought it would be a draw. Correct. Okay, I so I just thought we'd better check that. Now, in answer to your question, and Happy New Year, everyone. I hope you all had a good night last night. Um, yes, the performance I don't think was any better than a kind of six and a half, seven out of ten, but it doesn't really matter. And I don't actually think we're likely to get better performances than that while we've got so many key players in our spine out. It's just that's, that's the reality of it. So this period of time is about showing the desire and like the cojones to get through difficult periods. And Bournemouth were incredible. I was very impressed. Um, the way he's got them playing, I think, is kind of exactly the way that we like to play at our best. And they they caused us danger all the time, but it doesn't matter. We got we got over the line. We got the three points. We scored some good goals. Mm. And I think actually as well, probably Bournemouth fans would have felt just as edgy when we were going forward as I did when they were going forward. So it's just my kind of Spurs fanness that made me feel all the time like they were going to score every time they were in our in our final third. But um, the ex the expected goals showed that we had many more. It was like I don't know two and a half or something to or maybe three or something to us. Two point three. Um, Two point three. There you go. So um, you know the stats men, the stats nerds would say that we deserve to win the game, and I'm happy to go with them. Yeah, and I completely agree with that. And I think first of all, in my defence for my prediction, I didn't know Ben Tenkel was going to be back, and I think that definitely gave everyone a massive lift, um, especially when Jeez. seeing the lineup. Like there were rumours uh, before the um, you know a couple hours before kickoff that he might be involved in the game. No one really expected him to actually be starting the game though, and. To have that boost, especially um, going into January with Saar, um, which we'll talk about in a minute, you know, obviously bad injury for him, but Saar and Basuma not going to be available for this whole month or for the next, even maybe beginning of February as well. To have him back, not just um, just getting involved, but also starting games was absolutely massive. And I think it didn't just give... I think it gave all the fans a lift when seeing the lamp as well, but I'm sure it gave the players a lift as well. I mean, they must have known he was going to start, but I think it just gave everyone it, the the mood kind of flipped going into this game. I felt once those like yeah. once that lineup came up, it went from like a bit worried, you know, informed Bournemouth team off the back of a bad defeat to Brighton. Are we going to cope? And then all of a sudden, when everyone saw Bentancur in the team, I just gave. I think it gave everyone a massive uh, a massive boost and a lot more confidence that. We're getting some players back and some of our most crucial players back. And um, to have him back, I don't know how he did it. He was supposed to be out for two and a half months. And he was out for one month. Yeah. I mean, how the hell has that happened? Well, also very impressive from the club, I think, to uh, not let anybody know that he was training all week. He trained from the Monday, apparently, mm. every day. The only one who let it slip was his wife. And his wife <laughs> did let it slip the night before saying he's back. But I kind of took that with a pinch of salt because sometimes you see a lot of those things where players' partners kind of put an Instagram post out and it doesn't really lead to anything. People but People are now giving her a tier one, tier, oh, one. tier one. She's tier one gold medal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm up for that. It's fine. Give us some more information on uh, Radu Dragason, please. Uh, Benton Cool's wife. Yeah, but I agree with you. Yeah, huge. And um, oh, we've missed him. He's a Rolls Royce of a player. How did we get him for so cheap from Juventus? I'll tell you how. Paratici, criminal, amazing. <laughs> well done. Long may he continue with his uh, with his consultation role at Tottenham Hotspur. And let's face it, we're going. It looks like we're getting our centre back from. Italy again. So mm. you can't tell me that he's not involved in that somewhere. <laughs> but yeah, I think Pentonco is just a beautiful footballer. 
Also, I, I said to you before we went on on air, we've got so many kind of South American players now who are happy to put it in and really kind of be quite spiky on the pitch as well. But he's just got a, a lovely, graceful way about him as well. And for me, what I, I loved about him being back yesterday more than anything is I knew that when Emerson Royal and Ben Davis had the ball at their feet, mm -hmm. uh, and especially Emerson Royal, actually, I knew that we would have a player who was always wanting to come and get the ball, especially him, but also Gio Lo Celso as well. So I felt a little bit calmer about the possibility of Emerson playing at the back. And uh, and we'll go on to it, but Emerson, mm. I think, did pretty well. You know, he scared me at times, but he <laughs> did well. And I do want to give a little shout out now, actually, because just remembering, thinking about it, how good Ben Davis is with the ball at his feet. We, we don't actually give him enough props for those, not only those driving runs he sometimes makes to kind of get 40 or 50 yards up the pitch when there are no other options on and then get it out to the wide left player, but also he plays those little balls through the lines much, he's much better at it than I probably give him credit for. So I wanted to mention that, but yes, Benton Cole being back, loved it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as I was saying, it gave everyone a massive boost. And in fact, it was his interception, wasn't it, from Neto's yeah. um, loose kick, which obviously set us set the ball rolling quite early on, gave us uh, um, the lead Giovanni Celso's tackle finds Papa Matasar. Um, I, I was watching your um, watch long highlights and you were saying, why is he passing it? And you know what? I was saying the same thing to Ben at the time. I was like, why is he? Johnson's in, Johnson's in, pass it. But I actually think, you know, watching it back, he played that to perfection, not just because... Um, he scored the goal, but I actually think he opened up the space really well. It was the right yeah. decision because the defender got dragged away to Johnson. He, he found the opening. Brilliant finish. And you know what? For that those first half, that first half an hour as well, before Saar went off injured, um, we were actually on... That was probably one of our best moments of the game. We were on top of that moment. We looked energetic. And that Saar injury did really seem to, at the time, take the wind of our sails a bit, didn't it? I think that it really did. It was a um, bit of a switch up in the game. Obviously, Saar, clearly very emotional because of um he's got he wants to go to the afghan apparently actually the injury is not too bad mm -hmm. which is really good news for him so hopefully he can still go but in terms of the game itself we were in control i felt albeit bournemouth were threatening but i felt like we were much more in control very energetic and then once skip came on for the next like half an hour 40 minutes or so that game definitely flipped and i definitely think it flipped at that moment yeah totally agree i think Saar showed a kind of an energy about him in that first 20 minutes that had really been lacking in the Brighton game. And I'm the first to admit on the watch along of the Brighton game, I was disappointed with him. I felt like he looked leggy. I worried that maybe he was thinking a little bit about the African Nations Cup and because and was kind of two or 3% off it. And I wondered whether then, based on that kind of first 20 minutes performance uh, against Bournemouth, whether Ange had kind of said that to him, kind of said, look, you know, I know you want to go to this tournament and have a good tournament, but you, you've got to put it in for us. And I was really impressed with his, his energy and his legs. He was at, at his best in that first 20 minutes. And then, yeah, devastating that he, he got the injury. In terms of the goal, I agree with everything you're saying. He did open it up well, but I thought it was kind of funny how he did it. It was kind of like he went like left and then directly right <laughs> and then forward. It didn't seem kind of... Um, it didn't seem like intuitive movement, but it definitely worked because, yeah, Johnson was free and that's that made the defender kind of wonder which mm. which one to defend against. Um, good finish. I think we've said, I remember back in the day, I said it yesterday, I'll say it again. Uh, I remember back when we first signed Pat Matassar, the kind of boys on uh, the extra inch, the tactical boys who did their scouting on him were just like, he's actually got a really great long shot on mm. him. And then ever since he's been at Spurs, he's just been plowing them into row Z <laughs> over and over again to the point where now when I watch... Uh, the, I listen to the extra inside. So, um, sorry, they sometimes say, oh, actually, I think his technique for long shots is all wrong. <laughs> but actually, this one was great because he didn't try and hit it too hard. He kind of, it was almost like a more uh, guided Harry Kane-esque into the mm. bottom left-hand corner. And it was a great finish. And yeah, as you said, when he got injured, he was obviously really shocked and worried about it. But he tweeted, I think, last night saying more fear than injury, I think, looking forward to the AFCON. So he's happy to be going there. Sonny, obviously, off to the Asian Cup, and Basuma, obviously, you know, doesn't get on the pitch anyway, but he'll be at the African Nations Cup as well. And um, I hope they have good tournaments, but also I hope they all go out in the group stages. Mm. There was, there, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. There was also another player recently. I can't remember who it was. I think it might have been Richarlison maybe last season. He also, I remember he like went, I think it was just before the World Cup, wasn't it? He went down crying because he thought he was going to miss the tournament. Then he, but yeah. again, a similar situation. And he was Belize actually crying okay. yesterday. We love a crying. We, we do. Yeah, crying. there's been a lot of injuries to Spurs. Um, yeah, so the, for those next like 30, 40 minutes after Saar went off, 
Bournemouth definitely took control of the game. I think it's fair to say with the uh, like Slanky had had headers saved. He hit the bar. That um, in fact it wasn't just that Bournemouth took control. I think during that period they actually had more possession, which is very rare uh, for a team like Spurs, especially this season how we've been playing to be out um, out past basically by the opposition. It's not something that we're used to. Yeah. Um, but did you in those next in the in those in that 30, 30 40 minute period uh, or so when they were on top um did you did you ever feel like they were really going to take advantage of that or did you feel comfortable that we were actually defending quite well no i felt absolutely positive that they would score and i was <laughs> and i was shouting at the screen i was i was devastated about it i i think they got a number of corners i think they had like nine corners before we we yeah. we'd only had like two or three and uh, I was just like, we're just not on the front foot here. And yeah, the the SAR going SAR going off really knocked the wind out of our sails. But you've got to give credit. Like we could have collapsed there and conceded and we didn't. Their finishing wasn't quite there. And actually that's where I'd, I'd say um, that's the difference in a lot of these games is do you have players who are elite finishers? And although Richarlison did miss one, uh, the kind of through ball, which I'm sure we'll get to, you know, he did put his next chance away and obviously... Son put his chance away incredibly and he'd missed a chance before which I was shouting at him about. Mm. Um, but you don't get too many chances and Bournemouth uh, didn't really take advantage of theirs. I thought Solanke was a handful, looks a good player. But I've been asked before, do you think he'd be the kind of player that should Sp that Spurs should be interested in? I'm not sure whether he has the personality to play as a number nine for like a top level kind of top six club. Um, I could be proven wrong. I hope hope to be proven wrong. I think he's a really good player. And he's done it. He did it in the England unders age groups. He's obviously got all the talent. But yesterday on the big stage at a big time when they want to have a really kind of big, you know, statement result, they had the, he had the chances. The header, he hit the bar. I know with one that was a good block from from Ben Davis. But you need you need if you're going to Tottenham, you need to you need to take those chances when you're ahead. And they didn't. And as a result. You know, we found ourselves 3-0 up in a game where, and, and Brain's here in the watch along was like, I have no idea how we're 3-0 up, and it's true. And that shows that we have the elite finishers that Bournemouth don't. Yeah, and I think definitely at the time, for sure, when when we we did get a second wind, obviously a bit late in the game, but just talking about that period where Bournemouth were on top, I felt, I felt like they were so intense. We've seen... Um, how they've been playing over the last uh, 10 games or so, uh, how Iraola has got them playing such a relentless pressing system, uh, really suffocating the opposition. He likes to squeeze the pitch really high up. Mm -hmm. And I, f I felt like when they, when they were on top, obviously... They, they, they were causing us lots and lots of trouble. In fact, there were times we couldn't even get our our, our yeah, own half. That was it, was, it was really, it was really, really. Um, we looked like we looked as uh, Ange was saying on Thursday. We looked a bit leggy at those points. I was wondering where is his energy going to come from? You know, because I was all, I was also thinking because of that. If Bournemouth get one, they're probably going to get two because of that energy they were putting into the game. Luckily, we were able to um, just kind of. Uh, uh, see out that period without conceding um, fortunately but also I thought there was some good defensive uh, display there but what I was about to say is because of the way they play with their their relentless pressing because they didn't take advantage mm. and, and score I felt like then they started to look leggy when about an hour. Uh, exactly, yeah, and then yeah. and, and then it kind of equaled out, and then once they started to tire, that's when we took full advantage of that. And I think in in, in a weird way, we did something that we're not we haven't been doing that much this season. We, is, is we play a bit more of a transitional game. We were look, look, the chances were we were creating a lot more on the counter attack, and yeah. I think in a way. Yes, obviously, in general, we like to play possession-based and we like to dominate, but it's always good to in games like this when we are being dominated to have more strings to your bow and to be able to be effective on the counter-attack. And we did create some really good chances like that Richarlison chance, which he snatched at. And then obviously in the in the last 20 minutes, like um, that's where the chances were coming from those transitional moments. And um, that's always going to be positive when in games where you're off it, you can still be a threat. I agree. I also think, you know, what you said about us not being able to keep the ball and then winning the ball back incredibly quickly, that was exactly what I was complaining about at the time. Very frustrating. But I do think what yesterday really shows or or reminds me of is when we have our full team back, how good we're going to be. Because I feel like a, a lot of the reason we weren't able to keep the ball and we were losing the 50-50s and... Um, Bournemouth found it really easy to press Emerson Royal. They were actually letting Emerson Royal have the ball as much as they could and then pressing him, knowing that then they'd win the ball in midfield from his passing not being kind of really zippy and tight enough. And the midfielders, especially once Saar went off, Skip, who they could also press, not being good enough on the half turn, right? So mm. that just made me think, 
when we've got Madison back, when we've got Romero back, Van der Ven back to sweep anything up behind, when Bentancur's fully fit, when we've got everyone back, none of those things are going to be issues. Mm. Like, none of them are going to be issues because Madison's going to come as deep as he wants to get the ball. And then we're going to trust in our other midfielders to get Madison the ball in the in the pockets. And he's going to play people in. It's just going to be. I, basically, what I'm saying is, I've forgotten how good it was in those first 10 games sometimes, how beautiful it was to watch. And the fact that we're still winning despite the fact we're not able to do that at the moment is so exciting to me and so interesting. Um, and yeah, sometimes you just got to give props to Bournemouth. I think tactically they they did it really well, but they weren't able to keep it up. That 60-minute drop of theirs mm. was was visceral. It was very easy to to really notice. And uh, that's when we, we completely rolled them over. But yeah, I think it actually, you're right, it kind of stands us in good stead that uh, they've all had to play Conte ball for the last <laughs> two and a half years before Ange came in. So when it does become a transitional game, they know how to do it. One thing I would say is, I felt, and maybe this goes against Angie's philosophy, so that's why it doesn't happen. But I felt in that second period of the second of the first half, sorry, when we couldn't get out of our own half, you know, why couldn't we just maybe try and drop our tempo a bit and and play the ball around a little bit slower and just get people on the ball and make Bournemouth have to work harder? Whereas what we were doing was playing those difficult balls into midfield, trying to tip it round the corner, and we were losing out on the 50-50s, right? Mm. But I, I'd still say that this season is all about. And Ange would say this is all about really drumming into the players that this is the style we want to play and we want to be exciting the whole time. And so it's just another one of those games where we have to deal with our frustrations in the moment because there's a bigger picture. There's a longer term view that this is all about. And he's still finding out whether the players who are on the pitch at the moment are going to be there for the long term. I think Oliver Skip right now is treading a very thin line as to how long he's going to be around in this Ange ball revolution. Mm because he's going to get game time and he needs to show that he can do it. And at the moment, Bentoncourt, who hasn't played for like over a year, came in and showed immediately for me, as he did mm. in those 20 minutes against Villa or whatever, immediately for me that he's he's got it in the one and two touch play, the half turn stuff. Skippy is still so clunky on the ball. It's it's It might well just be a confidence thing. He, he's an elite player. He can do it. I'm sure he can do mm. it. But has he got the confidence to do it? at this level at the moment. I'm not sure he does. Yeah, I did really think he was struggling for large parts of that game after he came on, albeit um, I think there was a bit of a tactical switch with um, and when he brought Hoybier on, he made it more of a double pivot rather than like a lone yeah, six. Went to a forty-three. And I, I think I did help Skip, and I think it helped Hoybier as well in that in that in that period of the game, especially especially late on to give Spurs a lot more foothold in in midfield, and it also I felt like helped um, Giovanni De Celso really expressed himself, and I thought in those last twenty minutes, um, in those transitional moments, he was absolutely brilliant, bringing the ball forward, and obviously um, got some really good assists. Some of his passing was absolutely fantastic. A brilliant assist for Sonny's goal yeah. as well. Can so you, I think that was a good tactical drop, can switch. Can you think of another player in the history of football who has a trademark move that is a double-footed slide tackle to try and win any kind of... <laughs> Giola Celso does it. Uh, it's fascinating to me. He does it when it's a 50-50. Sometimes he does it when it's like a 70-30 for him anyway and he doesn't need to do it. He'll just On double foot. Days, he just wants to... It's not like a two-footed thing, but it's more like he just wants to slide along the ground mm. and use almost like his body weight as a block on the ball. It's an incredible move that he usually gets it right, but then once yesterday he did it and took the player out and gave them mm. a very dangerous free kick, which actually should say... Richarlison was incredibly brave in that because I don't know if you remember, it's a left-footed Tavernier free kick. Tavernier and he puts it the side that um, the Vicario is standing, but he hits it really well. It's going right in the corner. And just as he's hitting it, Richarlison takes a step to his right. And where a lot of players will turn their back, he didn't. He watched it all the way and actually almost guided it wide. Got to give him props because Richarlison gets a lot of stick. So when he does good things, I'm going to give him the props for it. That was great defending. Yeah, absolutely correct. And um, in to, going back to Giovanni Lo Celso, uh, I think that uh, as well, outside of the boot, when when the when the, when the ball's worn his right foot, <laughs> the outside of the boot to the left, that's becoming a bit of a trademark for him as well. And obviously, it was a brilliant assist for uh, uh, Sonny, the Sonny's goal as well, which pass. Sonny finished. And then obviously Richarlison, who who we just mentioned, he he a brilliant finish from him. And that, look, that that is also becoming a staple move now, isn't it? Johnson on the right, running down, first time ball across the face, and Richarlison with a first time finish. That's something that's it's look, uh, logically as well. It's going to be very difficult to stop for opposition teams because Johnson is just so quick. It is, and a lot of a lot of um, people have been wondering why Johnson isn't better than he is. I will stick to my guns and say, you know, we have bought potential. He's still raw, but he's doing something, and I'm talking specifically about that ability to, without looking up, play the ball at pace uh, in terms of the in terms of the cross, but also whilst he's running at pace, 
first time. It's De Bruyne-esque level crossing, and mm. it's very difficult, and not many players get that right. So the fact that we have that and he's going to improve over the next few years as well is very exciting for the future of Spurs, I think. Yeah, and uh, it was a, yeah, it was a brilliant assist for, for Richarlison again, who actually makes it five goals in his last five games now. So yeah. he can, carries on his brilliant form. I want to talk a bit about Sonny because it was a bit of a weird game for him. I, th I felt for large parts of that game, he was a bit on the periphery. Um, what Did have a few chances, but wasn't having his best game. And then he has this one chance in the second half, which he kind of screwed up. Yeah. Um, and it just he, I think like something flipped with him and then all of a sudden in the last 20 minutes I thought he really came alive he scored that goal I thought all of a sudden he found some uh, new confidence in the game he was really starting to take that game by the scruff of the neck and I thought he ended the game incredibly strongly mm -hmm. and obviously when he when you got that kind of finish, finishing ability that he showed for that second goal you can never uh, count, count Sonny out even if he's having a poor game yeah and I think I think a lot of it is confidence as well. I think Sonny knows and knew that he'd had not his best few games, even as far back as the Everton game. You know, he got that goal, obviously, but that was kind of more an instinctive thing. Whereas the goal yesterday was more like it actually got the ball was stuck under his feet and he had to do something really incredible to, to get it in from that tight angle. And I think that probably just took a weight off his shoulders. I agree he got better. And um, like I said in the last few weeks, I think he's probably carrying a knock and he's obviously thinking about the Asian Cup as well. And now he can go off there. He's not got injured. Uh, and he's got his goal, and he's, what, third in the goal-scoring charts in the Premier League? I think he's, well, joined second with Salah now, yeah. Joined second, uh, doing unbelievably well, and uh, I hope they do well, South Korea, but I also cannot wait for him to come back, because uh, we're going to need him. And I'm sure we'll talk about this more, but mm. it'll be very fascinating to see who Spurs do play on the left over the course of this, you know, starting with Burnley and then at Old Trafford uh, and the rest of January. Yeah, we'll get into that in a set. There's a lot, lot of uh, key key things to talk about there. But just to, to finish off on the game, obviously, we did concede. Alex Scott, um, you know, Boyhood Spurs fan, does come off the bench. And I thought I had a brilliant cameo. He scored uh, one goal and had another one ruled offside, which I, in the ground, they seem to be taking a long time to look over. I'm sure, was it a tight decision, that header? Uh, it was, wasn't... I found it scary, actually. I yeah. thought it was tight because Pedro Porro, where the cross had come from, Porro had stuck his leg out to try and block the cross. Mm -hmm. And actually, when you when they've stopped the line and, and started drawing the line, you think it might be because he looks kind of offside from where all the defenders are. But you wonder whether on the near uh, the near side of the camera angle, whether Poro has just uh, just kept him on. But but thankfully not. It was a, his second goal, the one that was disallowed, was mm. a beautiful header. And really great header. I think at that yeah. moment it was right at the beginning of stoppage time, wasn't it? So they would have had quite a long time to uh, have got back into the potentially got, got back into the game if that counted. But Luckily, that didn't count, even though I had a great cameo. We were able to see out the game. There was one incident as well to talk about, and that was with Veliz. Obviously, we made all our substitutions. Veliz came on and very quickly picked up uh, uh, an injury. I'm not sure what it was. Maybe a hamstring. I'm not really sure exactly. Yeah. what He was in a lot of pain. But I d I'm not exactly sure what was going on because he was clearly in pain. He was signaling that he couldn't continue. But he seemed to just continue, like try and carry on for like a good four or five minutes after that incident. And it actually led to an incident where Hoybier had two options on a counter-attack, Veliz or Son, both running in. He chose Veliz even though he couldn't walk when Son obviously, was obviously through on goal as well. And that was a very frustrating moment. And, and if Veliz wasn't on the pitch, you know, obviously Hoybier only has one option and he probably goes for Son. So it probably... Uh, it probably got to a point where Valise's presence was hurting us probably at that point as well. And I don't I don't know who to uh, exactly pull the blame on as to why he was allowed to remain on for so long. Because after the game, I was thinking, you know, surely if Ange just puts his foot down and says, you're coming off, that he comes off, surely. But Ange was alluding after the game that he was trying to get him to sit down yeah. and come off. And he said, unless I'm going to drag him off, what can I do? He didn't do it. And yeah. he, he tried to play on. And it goes to the character of, uh, he said, it goes to the character of Valise because he wanted to help the team. But it was a very bizarre incident, wasn't it? It was. And I think it showed a bit of naivety from Valise. He's a young kid. He knew we'd made all our substitutions. So he was like, well, I want to show that I can play through the pain and put my body in the way. But actually, he's just doing more damage to his body at that point. And... Yes, what he needed to do was just lie on the floor because eventually we would have kicked it out or the ref would have stopped it and then uh, we could have got a stretcher on for him, carried him off. He's a kid. I don't think it would have happened to an older player. I think it is what led to then Ange having almost a fight with the, mm. with the Bournemouth um, coaching staff and, and substitutes. My feeling on that is that I think the Bournemouth uh, team, you know, the coaching staff probably thought that Ange was telling his player to lie on the floor to waste time. 
but actually I think Andrew was telling him to do it so he doesn't injure himself more. And that is kind of like a natural uh, miscommunication that if it happened that way, if I was in the Bournemouth uh, kind of side of things, I'd probably think that was for game playing mm. reasons. Um, but it was fascinating to see how quickly Ange saw the red mist and totally lost it. Like, mm. he was... He had to be held back he, properly. But, but it wasn't one of those fake holding backs, I didn't <laughs> think, where it's like, oh, let me add him, let me add him. He was really livid with the guy. It was really mm. fascinating. I, we haven't seen that side of Ange yet. I've always known he's had the dog in him. You, you know he's got the dog in him, but really fascinating to see that. Australia's not, not, not slow to really... Uh, find a way to get at people if they're wronged and rightly so I wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of Ange no, exactly. all I'm saying 100% but, um, just a bit of naivety I think from Valise uh, do, do a, a you, weird situation yeah it, for that incident though is there any kind of blame do you put on Ange for not being maybe a bit more forceful in that situation just demanding he get he lays down um, I don't doubt if, if he was shouting enough to you know so that the Bournemouth coaching staff could hear uh, then I, I think he was probably doing all he could. And Valise mm. was probably, you know, he's a Valise. All, all those South American boys at Spurs show that they are, you know, that it's all about heart and passion. And I don't doubt that Valise was probably just trying to say, or not trying to say, but just being like, I'm going to show how important this club mm. is for me because, I, you know, he's just scored his first goal last week. He wants to, he just wants to show that he can do it. And uh, I, I would put more of the blame on Valise than Ange, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Fair enough. But look, we got the win in the end. Really, really brilliant victory in the circumstances against an informed team and as well with Arsenal losing one point behind Arsenal now, which is crazy to think about looking at the league table. Um, in terms of in general, obviously we're in a very difficult moment squad-wise and there's a lot of circumstances surrounding. And it, and it is weird because if you look at our form, I think after the win, we're now the most informed team in the league, four wins in the last five. Mm -hmm. But... When you just isolate our last four performances now, Forest away, Everton at home, Brighton away, and Bournemouth at home. Yeah. Obviously, three wins in those four games. The performance level, though, hasn't been brilliant in those games. No. So when you're assessing this period, obviously, we're, we're, going, we're getting great results. But is there any concern for you about the performance level or is it just you'd have to take all the circumstances into account and we're doing great yeah i think exactly exactly kind of what i said earlier it's it's literally just a matter of can we get through these games at the moment especially uh, and said it after the brighton game we're having to play all the all the same players so they're not getting any rest and they're not the players that were clearly in the preseason the best at playing and just type of football mm. otherwise they would have been the starters right so it's just been a, a period of time where it's like what results can you get under this kind of duress and they've been incredibly impressive because if you look you know you meant you brought them up and it, you're right it's really more fun when Arsenal lose but Arsenal have not really had many injuries and they are really suffering and that's because Arteta has been playing the same 11 pretty much mm. not squad rotating and it shows to me that I think Big Ange is doing a far better job than Mikel Arteta is this season. And he's not been able to spend £100 million on a player. In fact, he had to sell his best player for £100 million. So that's why some Arsenal fans are completely going insane at the moment <laughs> uh, and starting to doubt Arteta again. And it never takes them long to start doubting <laughs> Arteta, does it? Definitely uh, not. So let's see what happens there. But no, I think, I think we're just showing the desire to get through it. And like I said, we have to keep showing that desire until kind of end of January when we've hopefully get a full squad for, to, to choose from. And then it could the, the style of football could really get back to its best. Yeah, and to be fair to Spurs, even though the performance level maybe in the last few games hasn't been tip, uh, top, top, but yeah. we're still scoring some really good goals, aren't we? We're score, yeah. still scoring some really good team goals. We're still showing those moments of quality when we, when we really need to. And I think that's also a sign of a good team, even when you're not playing well or you're, you know, you're, you're being second best, but... You can still, uh, you know, uh, bring out that quality when, when to get a goal when, when uh, the occasion calls for it. And I think all three of our goals, to be fair, yesterday were really good team goals. Yeah, I completely agree. I think the main difference is, you know, we're just not able to batter teams at the moment in terms. Mm. Of, do you remember that that first twenty minutes against Chelsea? Like mm -hmm. we were all over them, like and in a in a consistently front foot, just winning the ball back time and time and time again. We're not able to do that at the moment. That's the kind of big difference. And then also. Are we able to? Well, I thought that you know, I thought the the four fullbacks did well yesterday, really well. But you know, in terms of defending at a top level and uh, you know cover space and stuff like that, we're also not able to do that as well. But mm. um, no, we we are we are far and above where I expected us to be, and the performances uh, results in the last five games are far more than I would have expected. Like think about it this way: we won four four and drawn one, uh, won four and lost one of the of the last five. 
we could easily have drawn two of them and maybe got a draw against Brighton, but we'd be in a much worse place. So the fact we got 12 points out of 15, mm-hmm. and that is, is really good. And I would I accept that Brighton loss if, you can, if you're kind of saying, you know, we lost one, but we might have drawn a couple of the wins. Do you know what I mean? So I think it, it's worked out really well for us over the Christmas period. Yeah, 100%. I think to get the level of points we have, uh, especially going into the Christmas period, you know, in in bad form in terms of results, you know, um, to, to pick up four wins to the last five, absolutely brilliant stuff. And look, we're three points off the top. Amazing. With th- I mean, does Spurs not get enough credit for being where they are, like in terms of how close we are to the top uh, of the league? I think we've kind of probably slipped up on the kind of come up on the inside a little bit quietly over the last few games but also you know it, it's worth mentioning Liverpool have got Newcastle at home today mm. I think Newcastle are in terrible form you know, anything can happen in the Premier League but they are far more dangerous at St James's Park than they are away from home I could see Liverpool maybe putting three or four past Newcastle and then we'll there'll be six ahead of us Liverpool have drawn a lot of games interestingly they've drawn mm. six games and only lost one um, but I would even say Liverpool don't look like they're dominating the league. City are starting to get there or thereabouts, even though they've had players missing. I think we're probably where we should be, but I would also go back to say if if that Chelsea game hadn't happened with the injuries and suspensions, we would be right up there. Yeah, 100%. And let's hope we can get some uh, additions this month as well to really help with the workload. We, we know now Son is off to the Asia Asia Cup. Um, uh, Postacoglu confirming that he will not be available for the Burnley game. Saar obviously going to be off to the AFCON with Basuma as well. So a lot of uh, going to be losing even more players now um, over the next uh, uh, few weeks. So... It's going to be very interesting to see how Postecoglou adjusts to that. Obviously, having Benton go back is a massive bonus mm-hmm. in this period. Very unexpected as well. Um, but when it comes to how we uh, replace what you know these players give us, or, or where who's going to come in for Son on the left, who comes in for for Saar in midfield as well. Obviously, we know Benton is going to come in for Basuma. Uh, um, who, if you were Ange? And uh, you would, if you just got the players, assuming we don't bring anyone in, mm. uh, if you just got the players at your disposal, mm. how do you manage these next few games? Well, what? I mean, I think the Burnley one's interesting because obviously our only experience of Ange in a cup competition so far disappointed a lot of the fan base because he he didn't play his mm. strongest team. We don't have a lot of options, I don't think, other than whether two things I'm kind of thinking of the top of my head for this Burnley game. Will he now blood some of those players that people have been asking him to blood? So would Alfie Dorrington get a game at centre half or Ashley Phillips? Am I right in thinking Donnelly was stripped off to come on yesterday? And I, didn't then, that, I didn't notice that. I didn't notice that. Notice okay, that. fine. Jamie Donnelly has obviously had a few cameo minutes, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if maybe Donnelly got a start. But let's say he doesn't. Would Ange be brave enough to play Benton Core, Gio, and Kulisevsky as a three in midfield? It's a very forward thinking midfield. It would be unbelievably fun to watch, I think. Mm. I think it really would. Uh, and it, I guess if that were to happen, then it would be probably, you know, Johnson on the right, Richardson, then Brett, and then um, Brian Hill, I guess, on the left. I'm not really sure what the other options are on the left. There's been a lot of talk of us being interested in, in getting another winger in mm. in January. And you can kind of see why. But, and this is something we talked about the other day, if... Um, if Ryan Sessegnon or even Perisic were fit, they would be getting minutes now as the kind of left forward, the left forward role. And actually, I think if you took the the defensive responsibility away from Sessegnon, he might have made a good option. I know lots of Spurs fans currently, you know, throwing throwing their old mince pies at him. <laughs> but um, he's an unbelievable crosser of the ball, just like Brennan Johnson is. And he's got pace, but... Also, you've got to think his hamstrings. So I don't know. I mean, who do you think will come in on the left? I'm not sure, basically. I've got a feeling that maybe Kulisevsky could get a run on on that side because there was a little cameo when um um against Newcastle for about 15 minutes uh Kul- he played Kulisevsky on the left and Johnson on the right and it, and and, he, and Kulisevsky actually looked quite creative in that role he actually looked quite good I don't think he was like taking people on no. but when he got into like the final third he was able to obviously got great delivery he was able to pick someone out and he created a few chances I remember he created a really great flow to cross for Ollie Skip who should have scored near the end so I'm feeling maybe if he goes Kulisevsky on the left Jones on the right, Rishi up front, and then Ben. It would be Benton, Caller, Celso, and probably Skip. I'm guessing. Oh, Skip or Hoybier. Yeah. So there's that option. Obviously, you could go really at that attack midfield, and maybe, I yeah, maybe you could put Brian Hill on the left. Uh, and because I don't think the I don't think he's going to want to move Johnson from the right. That's the thing. No, I think I, he's going to want to keep him there. He shouldn't. I mean, the other option is he brings in Jamie Donnelly in, as the third kind of central midfielder, mm. and then. 
yeah, Kulisevsky or Johnson. I don't know. It, it's That's why I think the Burnley game on Friday night would be interesting to see because it'll kind of, I think, give an idea of what might then happen for the rest of January because after that we've got Old Trafford. I've got a feeling on Burnley he's going to give give Hill a go. Just to, you know, he's going to give him a chance and see what see if he can do it because he in the in the games that he started, there's been very difficult games, isn't it? It's been he started the Etihad, he started against Villa. Um, I can't remember. But I think those are the only two starts, isn't it? And then I think he got dropped after that. So maybe he's going to say, "Look, Burnley at home. This is a great opportunity to really show you can against Premier League opposition, even though it's not the best Premier League opposition, that you can really take the game to them and cause them a lot of trouble." And if he if he puts him in again from the start and he's still you know not doing it, then I think maybe he gets dropped again. Do you think he should have scored from half a yard out? Yesterday, <laughs> maybe just about. I think just about. It was, uh, to, to it, was him, it wasn't it as was easy as it looked. Behind him, yeah. it was a tiny bit behind him, and obviously his hair was in his eyes, which I understand. So. <laughs> is that a problem that you've encountered? Uh, a lot? <laughs> the thing is with Brian Hill, he's obviously such a lovely boy, and he's obviously very talented, but you know he's missing one thing extra. So if he had an extra yard of pace, right, mm. then he'd be great. Or if he had an extra kind of foot of height and of, <laughs> and of physicality, then mm. he'd be great. But without one of those two things, I'm just not sure it's going to happen. And mm. uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see. Maybe he will play against Burnley, but he needs to do something that ups his confidence level a lot because he, he kind of just does a lot of bustling about and no kind of final ball at the moment or goal.